Good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to this year's rebranded Boundary Breaking Science Lecture Series brought to you by the Bio Foundation. So I'm sure most of you already know, but for those of you who don't, this lecture series was born out of the idea of driving more interaction and hopefully collaboration between the winners of the awards given by the Bayer Foundation and not only you, the Bayer R&D scientific community, but also our guests from the wider Bayer Foundation science network. So we have two I guess what we call flagship awards uh, for global scientific leaders. Uh, many of you would have seen last year's uh, lecture from Professor Ruth Lay, who received the Otto Bayer Award in 2020 for her really groundbreaking work linking the composition of the human gut microbiome and human disease pathology. Last year, and uh, Professor Kai Jonsson, so today's speaker, received the Hansen Family Award uh, for Medical Sciences, and naturally I'll introduce Professor Jonsson in a little bit more detail in a few moments. As you can see on the right hand side, so Professor Lay and Professor Jonsson have joined a very illustrious company, if you like. A number of our alumni, as you know, have gone on to win the Nobel Prize, and, and the number here were raised to four last year when Benjamin List uh, received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his contributions to asymmetric organocatalysis. In addition to our flagship awards, we also have the Early Excellence in Science Awards, which I think are really, uh, really exciting uh, recognition for breakthrough talents and arguably not just those with the potential to change the fields, but those people that are already demonstrating uh, the impact of their research uh, at such an early stage of their careers. And all four people you see on the slide here will join us later in the year uh, as part of this lecture series. So just very shortly to highlight, um, we have Marika Udalar, who won the prize for biology, and she's based at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen, and she was recognized for the development of methods to characterize the 3D genome organization, as well as her studies on interactions between gene regulatory elements at a single gene loci. Connor Coley uh, from MIT in Cambridge. He brings together actually chemical engineering, machine learning, synthetic chemistry, to look at virtual screening uh, prediction and automated chemical synthesis for small molecules. Uh, Dasha Neladova was recognized for really developing a breakthrough technology in medical sciences, combining uh, nanotechnology as a mode of drug delivery uh, together with gene therapy. And she was actually able to restore light sensitivity in the retina of patients suffering from age-related macular degeneration. So one of the most prominent causes of blindness associated with, with aging. And then finally, uh, Dr. Maria Zimmermann from Embel uh, here in Heidelberg in Germany. And she will actually be our next speaker and join us next month. And she's recognized for her insights into the metabolic interactions of gut bacteria uh, with the human host. And I think what's so exciting about Maria's work is she actually trained as a mathematician, computational scientist, and then moved over into the field of microbiology actually moved into the lab uh, for her postdoc. And I think uh, we're very much looking forward to Maria's lecture next month. A little bit of housekeeping today before I introduce today's speaker. Um, we will have a question and answer, so please use the Q&A tool in the chat and I will click the questions and moderate this at the end of the session. Following today's lecture, the recording will be made available in our team space. For those of you who are not already uh, members of that, we will post that now in the chat. Please join that and then you will be able to access the, the talks indefinitely. And then finally, a little evolution on last year, but uh, after the session, we will have a open discussion, uh, but this year they will be chaired by you, so our relevant experts from uh, Bayer, and we invited Sebastian Essig, who works in chemical biology in the life science technologies group, and he, together with a group 
group of experts will moderate and lead the discussion with Professor Jomsen, though please, you're all welcome to ask questions uh, and everyone is able to contribute. And I think uh, we will post the link for that directly in the chat if you haven't already saved it. So with that, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Professor Kai Jonsson. Um, Kai, please feel free to take over sharing whenever you are ready um, whilst I do the introduction. So Professor Jonsson uh, started his career in the early 90s at arguably one of the most exciting chemistry institutes in the world, so ETH Zurich, and he had really um, the honor of working with Professor Steve uh, Benner and was working on the development of catalytic polypeptides during this time. He then moved to UC Berkeley in the US and worked together with Peter Schultz, uh, a lot of his work focusing on catalase peroxidases before coming back to Germany in 1996, where he began his independent career at the Ruhr University in Bochum. I think then it's fair to say Professor Jonsson received an offer he couldn't refuse uh, as he was invited to move to the EP, uh, EPFL in the beautiful city of Lausanne in Switzerland. And it's here where Professor Jonsson really established himself as a global leader in chemical biology, progressing through the ranks, becoming full professor in 2009. And from our previous discussions, Kai, I guess that's where you thought you would spend the remainder of your career. But then in 2017, you really received a once in a lifetime opportunity and took up the offer of a directorship at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in Heidelberg, where you're also head of chemical biology. In addition to Professor Jonsson's academic roles, he's also currently the executive editor of JAX, so the Journal of the American Chemical Society. He's an elected member of EMBO, so the European Molecular Biology Organization. And throughout his career, he's also shown an uh, exceptional entrepreneurial spirit, having founded uh, four companies. Uh, and Probes for fluorescent microscopy are available through uh, Spirochem, uh, Spiro Spirochrome, my apologies. And I think the work that you're sort of most renowned for development of tools for protein labeling, so SMAC tag, SNAP tag labels, for example, are still available on the market. Professor Jonsson has really um, received a number of awards throughout his career, but what really stands out for me is the recognition by several leading pharmaceutical companies. And this really highlights not only the importance of Professor Jonsson's work within the academic field, but how it's really had an impact for the pharmaceutical industry. These have included the 2011 Amgen Lecture, the 2012 Novartis Lectureship Award, 2015 Abfi Lecture, and then the reason we're here today, uh, the 2021 Family Hansen Prize for Medical Science is given by the Bio Foundation. Professor Jonsson was recognized for his seminal work establishing distinct approaches to protein labeling in cells. And this has really enabled broad advances in chemical and cell biology. And with that, I hand over to Professor Jonsson. We're very much looking forward to your talk today, uh, Synthetic Probes to Spy on Cells. Thank you very much and welcome. All right, thank you very much, Carl. Um, can you all hear me well? Um, good. Um, first of all, um, Carl, thank you for the very kind introduction. I mean, it's a pleasure um, giving a presentation here. What is nicer for scientists than talk to um, his colleagues about um, your work, um, even though if it's only virtual um, today. Nevertheless, I'm, I'm really happy to do this. And I'm also looking forward to our discussion that we're going to have um, after my presentation. Throughout my career, um, I have been obsessed or passionate about visualizing um, biological activities in life cell with chemical tools. And this is going to be the um, topic of uh, my presentation today, synthetic probes to spy on cells. Before I start with my talk, um, I also wanted to give you a little bit of a background of um, what we have been doing, just a second. Um, over the last years, and um, I have decided to do this through uh, mentioning a couple of the paper that we have published. And um, starting on top, we're in a clockwise uh, manner. Then, um, in 
2003, um, already um, 20 years ago, um, we started to um, introduce the first um, self-labeling protein tag, a protein tag that in this case here was the SNAP tag that allows you to covalently attach synthetic probes to live cells. We have then um, introduced other tags such as the CLIP tag that was then published in 2008. And after introduction of these tools then went on also to develop synthetic fluorophores that would be, um, or fluorophores that would, would be required for um, doing live cell imaging using our text that we have developed. And an important paper there was um, in 2013, when we introduced the silicon rhodamine derivatives um, as a near red infrared fluorophore um, for live cell imaging. Um, we then expanded our applications, not only to self-labeling protein tags, but also trying to directly stain cellular structures and proteins. An important paper for us was in 2014, um, when we introduced fluorogenic probes for live cell imaging of, of the sky cytoskeleton. And these are probes that have become extremely popular in the field. Um, the um, work on fluorophores is a lot of fun in the laboratory because you create all these colorful molecules, but there's also so much to do in terms of finding fluorophores with interesting properties, not only spectroscopic, but also for in terms of permeability and applicability in biological systems. And so in 2020, um, a good two years ago, we came up with a new strategy to develop fluorogenic probes um, for live cell imaging. We have been very much interested over the last years, as you can see, on developing tools for labeling proteins or attaching probes to proteins, as well as developing the corresponding fluorophores that are needed for such experiments. But we also brought this together for the creation of sensors, either for applications in basic research, I'm going to talk about one example later on today, but also for diagnostic applications. So for example, in 2018, we published um, semi-synthetic sensor proteins for metabolic assays, in particular with a focus here on PKU. As you can already see, um, and as I already also said in the introduction, I'm very much passionate about visualizing tool or developing tools for visualizing biology. But we also have interests in understanding drag actions. For example, we have figured out that the old anti-inflammatory drug sulfasalazine acts on affecting the biosynthesis of the cofactor tetrahydrobiopterin. And then based on that, we found out that um, also sulfur drugs have this biosynthetic pathway as an off target that explains some of their side effects that we have published in 2013. And about two years ago, we introduced a method that allows you not only to label or visualize proteins, but also to control the activities through chemogenetic controllable nanobodies. Um, and that is also work that is ongoing in our laboratory. But the focus of my presentation today will be on um, imaging and um, visualization of biological activities. I have um, divided my talk in three parts. I will first talk about fluorescent probes, then I will talk about a semi-synthetic biosensor for an important metabolite, a cofactor, coenzyme A. And then in the end, we'll talk about a new um, approach that we have developed for integration of biochemical activities in live cells. Um, and we'll talk about one example where we have an integrator for calcium um, that we are going to use to interrogate um, activation of neurons in vitro, in cell culture, but also in vivo. The two last parts of my presentation, the um, sensor for CoA, as well as the calcium-dependent protein labeling, is work that has not been published yet. OK, so let's start with the first um, part of my talk. And as I've already um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, told you um, that um, about 20 years ago, we introduced the first self-labeling protein tag, the SNAP tag. And since then, other tags have been developed, in particular the HALO tag that has become extremely popular also for live cell imaging, in addition, our CLIP tag, or also the um, ACE and carrier protein-based protein labeling. And all of these tags, they are conceptually doing the same thing. They allow you to covalently attach a synthetic probe to a protein of interest. And the tag then serves as the mediator that then is expressed as a tag 
or the, the to the protein of interest converting it into a fusion protein and then you add the probe for the labeling experiment and while these methods are fairly general what was always the main problem for applications in imaging was that those fluorophores that are most exciting for biophysicists to be used in life cell imaging fluorophores that are very bright photostable and are excited and emit in the far red region of the spectrum because there is less um, back autofluorescence background uh, that you have in such imaging experiments these fluorophores usually are not compatible with life cell imaging and so i show you here a couple of um, structures of fluorophores that are very popular for in 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 vitro studies um, for biophysicists to use um, such as the cyanine dye oxazine or carbopyronine dyes and all these dyes are far red fluorophores with exquisite brightness and photostability and are very popular for imaging however these molecules if you look at their structures you probably immediately realize that what makes them good fluorophores, these extended pi electron system makes these molecules very hydrophobic, sticky. And then to keep them in solution, you sulfonate them. And so you create these molecules that through their properties are membrane impermeable and can actually not be used for life cell energy. So that of course was always a great frustration because we had this fantastic method for labeling proteins but the dyes or probes we really wanted to use for life cell imaging, we couldn't get them into cells. An important um, advance there for us and the field in general was when in 2013, and that was work that was done in our laboratory by Grashvigas, Lupina Vizios, as well as Keitaro Umezago. They were working on carboxylated silicon rhodamine derivatives. This is a fluorophore you show, see here the structure on the left part of, this, of the slide that um, is excited at around 650 nanometers. And so it's a far red fluorophore. It is a bright molecule, has a good extinction coefficient and also photostability. But what this molecule also possesses is an interesting property is that it exists in a dynamic equilibrium with a non-fluorescent state, a so-called spirocyclic form. In this case here, a spirolactone. And if you look at these two structures, is the spirolactone is a non-charged molecule. Whereas the twitter, the, the, um, the silicon rhodamine in the open form is a twitter ion, has these two charges and is also for, it's, um, responsible for its fluorescent properties. And this equilibrium is dynamic and it is also dependent on the environment in which you have the fluorophore. So the twitter ion is stabilized in aqueous solution. But if you increase or decrease the um, dielectric constant, of the solvent by, for example, adding dioxane as a co-solvent to your solution, you shift the equilibrium towards the spirocyclic form. And you can see this by measuring the absorbance of this molecule in different solvent um, water dioxane mixtures, where at 0% of dioxane, you have predominantly the twitter ion. But as you then increase the dioxane content, you shift the equilibrium towards the spirolactone. And you can then see this is you lose the absorbance at 650 that then is also responsible for the um, excitation and emission of your fluorophore. So then you might say, well, that isn't really such an advantageous property if you have a fluorophore that exists in two states and in one of the states it is not fluorescent um, because that can only decrease the brightness. But the important consequence of this dynamic behavior in life cell imaging as we then found out is that if you create probes based on silicon rhodamines that then can exist in this dynamic equilibrium and usually when you have probes attached to it the equilibrium is shifted towards the spirolactone the spirolactone being less polar than the twitter ion has much higher permeability and so can permeate into cells through passive transport that then inside the cell it can bind to its target and then this change in equilibrium by shifting the fluorophore towards the polar protein surface of your target you shift the equilibrium towards the fluorescent open state so what you have is a molecule that 
prior to binding to its target is present mostly in a non fluorescent state that allows it to enter cells and then upon binding to its target turns fluorescent. We call this property fluorogenic or fluorogenicity, that is, the molecule becomes fluor uh, fluoroform only upon binding to its target. And that, of course, for live cell imaging is a fantastic property because you reduce background, you have good permeability, and um, that then allows you to do imaging experiment um, where you do not even have to wash away unbound probes. And this, as I um, already mentioned, we published about nine years ago in a nature chemistry paper, where we showed that these cell-based fluorophores can be used to label um, self-labeling protein tags such as SNAP-tag, HaloTag, and ClipTag. You will have very good specificity in the labeling, very little background. The fluorophore is bright and good photostability and is even applicable for use with super resolution microscopy techniques such as that. So um, that was great. And that opened the field for us because now we identified a mechanism of how we can increase the permeability of fluorophores. That has not only been exploited by us, but also by many other groups, in particular also the group of Luke Leibis. Um, they have um, then focused on controlling the spirolactone formation here by changing the properties of the fluorophore. And compared to regular rhodamine, such as tetramethylrhodamine, what was necessary is to shift the equilibrium from the open form towards the spirolactone. And you can achieve this as this is a reaction between a nucleophile, the carboxylate, and an electrophile, the xanthine ring, by making the xanthine more electrophilic, either through the incorporation of the silicon or by attaching electron withdrawing groups on the xanthine ring, for example, through fluorination, either directly on the xanthine groups or on the alkyl groups that you have on the exocyclic amines here. This is um, an interesting strategy to achieve control over spiral lactone formation. However, what you do is you do chemistry on the business end of the fluorophore, so to speak. And for example, fluorination can also affect quantum yields of fluorophores. And ideally, what you would like to have is to control this equilibrium without affecting the properties, the spectroscopic properties of your fluorophore. And the solution to achieve that, or an approach to achieve that, was developed by um, Lu Wang, um, a postdoc at the time in our laboratory. And he's now um, an independent researcher professor at Fudan University where he then realized that instead of making the xanthine more electrophilic, I could also make the nucleophile more nucleophilic. That is, he changed the carboxylate to, uh, um, by amides with substituents that make these amides very electron deficient, such as amino nitriles or um, sulfonamides substituted or not or sulfones. And so that then allowed him, as you will see um, in a minute, to control this formation again of spirocyclic formation. What you form now is not a spirolactone anymore, but a spirolactam. But you have control over this equilibrium. It's a dynamic equilibrium without changing the properties of the xanthine and thereby the fluorophore. Let me first. Um, um, explain to you this in greater detail by looking at the properties of tetramethylrhodamine or how we can control spirocyclization and tetramethylrhodamine. Um, the tetra structure of tetramethylrhodamine is, has like a, a four methyl groups here on the um, exocyclic amines, and the normal tetramethylrhodamine has a carboxylate here at the auto position of the benzene ring. And normal tetramethylrhodamine, this is here in water dioxane concentration, exists mostly as the Twitter ion and only at very high dioxane concentrations. It starts to shift the equilibrium towards the spirolactone, such that for biological applications, tetramethylrhodamine probes can be considered to exist only as the Twitter ions and thereby have relatively low permeability. However, if you now replace these autocarboxylate, with amides with electron deficient substituents, 
What you can see is then depending on the nature of the substituent that you use, either the amino nitrile or here the sulfonamide, you can shift the equilibrium towards the spirolactam that then you can already have at relatively low dioxane concentrations or relatively high dialectic constant and shift of the equilibrium from your switter ion to the spirolactam. This then allows you to use tetramethyrolamine as a fluorophore in various probes that can be used either for self-labeling protein tags such as SNAP tag or halo tag, but also for labeling of um, cytoskeletal structures such as here a taxol-based um, dye for microtubuli or yes, plaquinolid-based probe um, for actin. And what you see here on the slide is always the comparison of between the performance of the regular tetramethylrhodamine as well as the dye where we have in tetramethylrhodamine replaced the carboxylate with this electron deficient amide, which we in the following call MAP dyes for Max Planck dyes because they perform so well. What you can see here, for example, for SNAPTEC is when you take the regular TMR SNAPTEC substrate, you have very little or poor labeling at low concentrations and under no wash conditions. Whereas with the MAP555 type, you have very intense, fast labeling and relatively low background, a really good signal to noise. The same for the HaloTech. Exchanging the TMR for the MAP555 clearly increases signal to noise. Similar, for example, for the Yasplakinoli derivative that then you can use to stain F-actin. Whereas with the TMR probe, you don't really see any significant labeling. The TMR probe gives you staining of a similar quality as the corresponding surdi. So what we have is a method that allows us to take advantage of the good spectroscopic properties of tetramethyrhodamine because it is a good dye, but tune the equilibrium between the spirocyclic form and the open form to make it biocompatible and fluorogenic. This not only works for tetramethylrhodamine, but you can use the same trick to control the properties of various other rhodamines. And so, for example, what you see here on this slide are probes for halotech based on rhodamines with different alkyl substituents or um, um, substitutions in the xanthine ring from oxygen to carbon to silicon. And these dyes then are called based on the excitation spectrum up 510, 618 or 700. And what you can see is again, the comparison of the performance of the MAP dye with a regular carboxylate based rhodamine derivative. And you can always see that the signal to noise ratio is much better if you use a more fluorogenic and higher permeable dye than the corresponding um, regular rhodamine derivative. Some of these dyes have extreme fluorogenic properties. For example, here the carborodamine based probe, the MAP618 halotech based probe, shows an increase of roughly a thousand fold um, in its fluorescence. Um, emission um, intensity compared to the regular carborodamine probe, which um, is um, outstanding for live cell applications. We then, and this is work now of um, Nicolas Ladon, um, a, a graduate student from our laboratory who actually yesterday finished um, his PhD thesis. Then Nicolas was interested in controlling this equilibrium of spirocyclization with much greater precision and over a wider range that we have done in the past. And to achieve that, what he did is he then synthesized amides here bearing different substituents where he controlled the electron withdrawing properties of these molecules by, for example, having benzene sulfonamides with various electron withdrawing substituents to benzene sulfonamides with electron pushing equivalents or also going to more regular amides. For example, here this fluorinated or a simpler just, an, just a simple amide, which however is fully in its closed state. And by then having all these molecules available, he could precisely for each probe and each application identify the optimal substituent. And I show you this um, for um, 
the fine tuning of rhodamine 500R. Rhodamine 500R is a green fluorophore. Its structure is shown here. And the carboxylate of that exists mainly in the open state. And so then what Nicholas did is he synthesized um, rhodamine 500R substituents, uh, derivatives with various substituents here at the amide function. And then among these for different pro for different labeling approaches, such as SnapTech or HaloTech, identified that substituent that gave the best signal to noise, signal -to -noise um, ratio in live cell imaging experiments. And so, for example, for the SnapTech probe, he identified that the benzene sulfonamide with a fluoro group in the para position gave the best signal to noise, whereas for the HaloTech probe, the methylated version of that gives the best signal to noise. The difference here reflects that HaloTech is much better in opening up or interacting more productively with the open form of the fluorophore than the SnapTech. And I will get back to this a little bit later. And these probes are very useful for live cell imaging, but then what you can also do is for certain applications in microscopy, for example, single molecule localization microscopy, you need fluorophores that almost completely exist in their closed state, but only occasionally or spontaneously then go to the open fluorescent state, and we call this kind of behavior blinking, spontaneously blinking probes. And for example, by then taking Fordamine 500R and providing it as a substituent with an amide that pushes the equilibrium almost completely to the closed form, you can generate a probe that only occasionally is present in its fluorescent um, state. And this spontaneously blinking probe is very um, attractive for applications in single molecule localization microscopy, which is one form of super resolution microscopy. So um, what I have shown to you here in, in, in this part of my presentation is an approach where we take rhodamines, tune their bio, of, like their biocompatibility, if you want, and fluorogenicity by controlling of the spirocyclization equilibrium, attaching them to different probe um, warheads or ligands for um, directing these fluorophores to um, their targets in live cells. And by having this suite of differing probes with different colors and different ligands for localization, what we can do now is experiment where we have cells and simultaneously combine them with a different set of probes that bind to different targets and then do imaging even without washing steps. And you can see examples of um, these kind of experiments here on the slide, where we have probes targeting SnapTech, HaloTech, or actin, microtubuli, the nucleus, and other um, cellular compartments and structures. And this for us is sort of our vision or where we think um, this imaging should go, these, these kind of um, work on, on developing probes for live cell imaging using synthetic fluorophores that have superb spectroscopic properties making them biocompatible and fluorogenic and then localize them to the targets that you want. However, the opportunity or the possibility to create the spirocyclization by attaching amides to rhodamine derivatives not only allows you to control fluorogenicity, but you can also introduce additional properties. And so, for example, Nicole Mertes, a graduate student who also graduated just very recently, had the idea of taking then these kind of rhodamine dyes and instead of just having a regular sulfonamide, benzene sulfonamide, as Nicolas has shown for the fine tuning of, um, of his fluorophores, is to use this to introduce here also an indicator, such as this Bacta dye that can um, chelate to calcium and thereby create double fluorogenic calcium indicators that um, have this calcium sensing of um, moiety, but before they bind to the halo tech, they exist predominantly in the spirocyclic form, are not fluorescent. Upon binding to halo tech, they go to the open form, become slightly fluorescent, but the BAPTA molecule before binding to calcium through PET quenching quenches the fluorescence of the dye significantly and then upon calcium you have the fully unquenched or um, fluorescent dye um, that then 
um, is what we call the double fluorogenicity, that is localization as well as binding to a molecule such as calcium only gives you the fully fluorescent molecule. And so thereby you can create localizable um, calcium indicators based on synthetic fluorophores that based on their spectroscopic properties are superior to um, fluorophores based on autofluorescent proteins. And so what Nicole did is she used that, um, the, her idea, developed her idea by attaching these BAPTA moieties to different fluorophores, chain, um, starting from tetramethylrhodamine to the silicon rhodamine that is covering more than 100 nanometers in colors, but also controlling the affinity by changing the structure of the BAPTA dye. Um, by going from high affinity calcium chelators to low affinity calcium chelators, such as this molecule here. So you have a suite of localizable calcium indicators that define their color, but also in their affinity. And these molecules can be used for live cell imaging. And what I show you here is um, um, an application or an ex experiment where um, um, Nicole um, used primary neurons um, and then expressed in these neurons, these are hippoc hippocampal neurons, um, um, an halotech EGFP fusion protein localized in the cytosol. And then by simply adding her dye without any washing steps, she could get really highly specific labeling um, with very little background. And you can see here by comparing the EGFP signaling uh, signal with the um, signal that you got from the indicator, that is very, very um, efficient and clean labeling. And um, more importantly, that then the indicator is also responsive to calcium. And you can see this here by electric field stimulations, where you can then see that even single action potentials can be resolved um, with um, these indicators and the kinetics of binding and unbinding of calcium of these synthetic chelators are superior to those of um, indicators based on um, fluorescent proteins, such as the popular GCAMP um, indicators. Another experiment that, that Nicole did is where she localized a low affinity indicator in the ER of neurons and a genetically encoded indicator in the cytosol then stimulated the neurons with caffeine. And then what you can see is that as the calcium flows from the ER to the cytosol and the ER calcium goes down and at the same time, the calcium in the cytosol goes up. And here, what is important is that then you can choose the color of the indicator that you use. So that is compatible for multicolor experiments with genetically encoded calcium indicators. Um, what we have done so far, or what I've talked about so far, is where we use chemistry to control the properties of the fluorophore. However, the properties of the fluorophores can also be controlled by tinkering with the protein. Because there's this interaction between the fluorophore and the protein when the fluorophore is bound to the protein. And this is most pronounced for the halotech, as I already mentioned. And so Michel Frey, um, a former graduate student in, in our laboratory, had the idea that by creating halotech mutants, she might be able to control, to generate mutants that differ in their brightness as well as the lifetime of the attached fluorophores because of the specific interactions of mutations that you introduced with the structure of the fluorophore. And so by creating libraries of halotech and then screening these for higher brightness or lower brightness, she identified halotech mutants that relative to halotech 7, such as halotech 9, had either longer or shorter lifetimes. So she identified like, well, like three of the, the mutants that are the most interesting. She then called Halotech 9, 10, 11. Halotech 9 is brighter and has longer lifetime. 10 and 11 have shorter lifetimes. And why is this interesting? Because then you can use Fresen's lifetime multiplexing to look at multiple species in one cell using only a single fluorophore. So imagine an experiment where um, Michelle, um, then actually what she did is express halotech 7, 9, and 11 fusion proteins in cells, for example, in the nucleus, um, mitochondria, and the Golgi, and labeled them all with the same fluorophore. Spectrally, they're indistinguishable. But through phaser analysis, 
as they have different lifetimes, you can separate them again. And so then, then you can see this here represented with these false colors that allows you using a single color to do multiplexing for different targets. And that, of course, creates another dimension, if you want so, for multicolor experiments, where you have in one dimension um, the wavelengths and in the other the lifetime. And that is something that I find very exciting and um, that is going to be pursued um, by Michelle and also in our laboratory. Um, another um, interesting further development is that that we also go back to the structures that we use or the, the chemical structures that we use for the labeling. For example, snap tech and halo tech, as you already learned, are pro or techs that are based on covalent labeling. Why can't we also create um, labels that bind non-covalently reversibly, such as by changing the chloroalkan of the halo tech into a different functional group that still binds but it doesn't undergo this SN2 reaction. And why would that be interesting? A reversible labeling would open up new microscopy applications, such as paint microscopy. But reversible labeling also should increase the photostability in experiments where you have high light intensity. Because if the fluorophore is bleached, but it can bind and unbind, you can replenty the, uh, the, replace the fluorophore with a non-bleached fluorophore and continue the imaging. And this is something that Julian Kompa in our laboratory, lab, um, laboratory has developed, a PhD student who started them less than a year ago. He came up with new exchangeable X HDL halotech ligands for halotech 7, the regular halotech, and the halotech Newton these, that bind non covalently that, that is um, can be exchanged, excuse me, and then uses these, for example, for STET microscopy, where now he can, over much longer time frames, look at these proteins in STET microscopy. For example, here he had labeling of a mitochondria on lysosome, and then over 20 frames was able to look dynamically at the lysosomal mitochondrial contacts that um, are an interest uh, of, of great interest currently in, in research. I will not go further into this, but rather now jump um, to um, another application of protein labeling is where we can create sensors for metabolites. And the sensor, um, the, the approach that we use for creating our sensors are based on um, protein labeling again, as I already um, said. And um, the overall design principle of our sensors is as follows, is where we have an analyte that we are interested in. We identify a receptor protein that can bind to this analyte, express this receptor protein as a tag with two self-labeling proteins. And one of the self-labeling proteins is then labeled with a molecule that contains a ligand that binds to the receptor only in the presence of the analyte and in addition as a fluorophore. And the other tag is labeled with another fluorophore. And so depending on the concentration of the analyte, your biosensor, the SNFIT, exists in two conformations in open state, where there's not enough analyte present to um, allow the ligand, the tethered ligand, to bind to the receptor, and the state where when the analyte binds to the receptor, the tethered ligand can bind. This conformational change then leads to a change in distance between the two fluorophores, where in the closed state of the sensor you have high fret efficiency, whereas in the open state you have low fret efficiency. So you have a ratiometric fret based sensor, and the readout is fret efficiency, and the equilibrium is only controlled by the concentration of the analyte. We have used this approach for creating sensors for NAD and NADP. I'm not going to talk about this, but recently um, also have came up with sensors for um, the metabolite or cofactor coenzyme A, which is a very important molecule in various metabolic pathway and biological processes. And up to now, there is no biosensor for imaging or visualizing changes in coenzyme A, CoA concentrations in live cells. And so this was something that then was taken up by Lin, Lin Xu, who is currently or now is an um, um, independent researcher at um, the University of Science and Technology of China in Hefei. 
And he had the idea when he was a postdoc in our laboratory to create a snippet for coenzyme A. Oops, and um, the coenzyme A sensor that then he created, what he would need first was a receptor for coenzyme A, and the protein that then he used was pantothenate kinase, bacterial pantothenate kinase. And why bacterial pantothenate kinase as um, the receptor for CoA? Because these enzymes are allosterically controlled by CoA, that is, in addition to their active site, they possess a site for CoA binding. And what was also known is a bacterial inhibitor for um, an inhibitor for bacterial pantothenate kinase that has been published previously, this structure here, that then we tethered through a rhodamine derivative to a chloroalkan that then allowed us to generate the sniffet where you have this pantothenate kinase expressed as a fusion protein with GFP and halotech. You label the halotech with this kind of structure here that you synthesize. And then in the absence of CoA, the inhibitor can bind to the pantothenate kinase and shows punk, whereas at high concentration of CoA, now you displaces the tethered ligand from the receptor protein. And so again, what you have is a change in FRET efficiency as a function of the concentration of CoA. You can see this here in the titration curve that in the presence of CoA, you have um, low FRET, and then as the core uh, concentration has gone down, the sensor can close, and you have higher FRET um, um, efficiency. The sensor is specific for CoA. You can see this here in this graph here. It responds to concentration changes in CoA, but to have consent to, to open the sensor with acetyl CoA, you will need to go to much, much higher concentrations. And as in cells, CoA concentrations are higher than acetyl-CoA. What we can say is that our sensor will report on changes in CoA, but will not be re respond to changes in acetyl-CoA, because first of all, our sensor has relatively good specificity for CoA, and acetyl-CoA concentrations in cell are much lower. We then also looked at the specificity of our sensor for other metabolites, CoA derivatives, or other nucleotides that, of course, could all bind. And what you see here in this experiment is that only CoA at by physiological relevant concentrations was able to label or open the sensor up. And then what you can see also is that then you take the protein, you express it in cells in different compartments, such as cytosol or mitochondria, then synthesize the sensor in the cell by addition of the substrate that I have shown to you before that then leads to the fluorescence labeling. And then you can do the ratiometric analysis of CoA levels in response to changes in environment or overexpression or depletion of certain genes that you believe are important for CoA metabolism. And um, I show you a few experiments that um, Lin has done. Summarized here is the biosynthesis of CoA, starting with pantothenate, vitamin B5, that then is through the kinase, is phosphorylated, um, condensed with cysteine that is decarboxylated, and then ligated with adenosine triphosphate to form dephospho-CoA, which is then phosphorylated to form the CoA. And then also what in particular in mitochondria is important is the hydrolysis of CoA, to um, phosphopantothene and um, this um, diphosphoadenosine um, derivative that hydrolysis mediated by the enzyme NUT8 is important to control the levels in mitochondria. And so what we did is we overexpressed certain enzymes in this pathway or depleted them and then looked at how this affects um, concentrations of CoA either in the cytosol or in mitochondria. And what you can take from these experiments, I'm going through this quickly, is that overexpression, in particular of the kinase, controls um, levels of CoA both in the cytosol and mitochondria. The, the last step in the biosynthesis, the coasi, the biosynthesis, uh, this synthase that uses then um, ATP and um, the phosphopantothene and then also does the phosphorylation. Overexpression of that 
increases CoA levels in mitochondria, but not in the cytosol, which supports the mitochondrial localization of this enzyme. And what we can also see is depletion of this hydrolase here in mitochondria increases CoA levels in mitochondria. And so this gives us a better idea of which enzymes control CoA homeostasis in cells. Another class of enzymes extremely important for controlling CoA homeostasis in cells is not only enzymes um, involved in biosynthesis, but also transporters that are required to move these polar molecules across membranes, for example, the precursors of CoA biosynthesis into the mitochondria, where then it is phosphorylated and then also transported out or in um, again. And so what we did is experiments where we overexpress these transporters alone or in combination, and that led us together, together with experiments from the literature to able to propose a much more detailed map of how CoA, CoA homeostasis in cells is controlled. And I think this is a nice example how this combination of synthetic chemistry and protein engineering allows you to create sensors for biochemical activities or biomolecules, such as this important cofactor, that then create new insights that you did not have previously. Um, that now brings me to the last part, and that will be relatively brief, but I still want to discuss this with you um, because we are very excited about this, is this um, calcium-dependent protein labeling cup holder. And so what are we trying to achieve there? What we want to have is um, a tool that allows us to mark neuronal activity in freely moving animal um, simply by expressing of a biosensor and um, applying a synthetic molecule. And we achieve this by taking our beloved self-labeling proteins and engineer them in a way that labeling is dependent on the presence of an effector, such as calcium. And so the design principle of the approach is shown here. We take a self-labeling protein, we cut it in two, that it is no longer active, then take these two fragments, combine them with a sensing molecule that then upon the presence of an effector binds to the effector, leading to a conformational change, generating the active protein again, that then can be labeled with a fluorescent substrate. So what you have is a self-labeling protein now that can only be labeled efficiently in the presence of an effector. This is work that was initiated by Julian Hiblot in, in, in our laboratory and is now done by, um, continued by Magnus Huppert, Jonas Wilhelm, and recently also by Nicola Porswick. And why would you want to do this? Imagine you would have such a biosensor, um, for example, for calcium, that then can be used to label neuronal activities because calcium increases are um, um, associated with activation of neurons. If you would have such a sensor, you express it pan-neuronally in a mouse, you could, for example, start an experiment where you inject a dye, expose the mouse to some maze or other environmental stimuli at a later time point, come with a different colored dye. And during the stimulation and the presence of the dye, those neurons that are activated will be chemically labeled. So that then you can later come, retrieve the tissue, and then analyze for labeling. So you integrate for neuronal activity for later analysis that then allows you, for example, to identify neuronal um, networks. So how do we do this for calcium? Um, what we did, or Julien, um, to be more precise, is we take the halotex circular permitted and then excise the small peptide from the new termini that are now close to the active site. This peptide has low affinity for the halotech, but at high concentration, it can nevertheless complement the the, this halotech and generate an active version of it that then can be labeled with a synthetic fluorophore. You now take these two parts, the peptide and this truncated halotech, which we call CP halo delta, and then combine them or connect them with a protein that contains calmodulin, the calcium binding protein, and the peptide M13 that binds to calmodulin only in the presence of calcium. So in the absence of calcium, the peptide does not bind to CP halo delta, the protein is not active, but in the presence of calcium, the peptide binds, you generate active halotech that then can be labeled. 
and you can see how this works here in this experiment where we have calcium labeling of the protein in the absence of calcium. There is almost no labeling. And in the presence of calcium, we have very fast labeling. And most importantly, when you then start labeling in the presence of calcium, but then scavenge the calcium, for example, through the addition of EGTA, you can interrupt it. And then later by adding more calcium, continue with the experiment. That is, this equilibrium here is reversible. And only when you have calcium and the dye present, you can have labeling of the protein. And the difference in rates between calcium bound self labeling protein, tercaprola, as we call it, and not calcium bound um, form is roughly four orders of magnitude. Um, what can you use that for? You can use this for in vitro assays, for example, if you would like to see that in cells, um, if there are like drug action that lead to rises in calcium, you can then have this Caprola sensor in the cells present. You stimulate the cells in the presence of the halotech substrate. And only when the drug activates or binds to a target and leads to calcium changes, you will have efficient labeling. And what is important here to keep in mind is that this transient signal of calcium now is transferred into an irreversible signal that then can be retrieved later by looking at the ratio of labeled dye versus a reference dye such as GFP. So a transient signal is transferred into an irreversible signal and you also integrate over times where the substrate is present. The most interesting applications for us, as I already pointed out, of course, is in neurobiology currently. And we were able to show that these Carpola biosensors work also well in neurons. I show you here experiments for electric field stimulations where already after 15 action potentials, you can see a difference between non-stimulated neurons. So these molecules or these sensors are not suitable for detecting single action potential as a regular calcium indicator. But what you do is you integrate over longer time periods. And then, of course, finally, the most interesting um, application that I want to share with you is um, in vivo. The um, model organism that we're currently looking at is um, zebrafish because they're very well suited for these kind of experiments because the zebrafish is transparent. That makes the analysis easy. And you can simply bath it in solutions of the dye where then um, you have or induce labeling. And these are experiments that we initiated um, Janelia Farms in um, collaboration with Eric Schreiter and Luke Leibis, and more importantly, recently worked together with Herwig Bayer in, at the Max Planck Institute in Munich. And um, I show you here first experiments that, that Magnus did is where he has um, zebrafish or the larvae that express panuronally our capola, then bath them in solutions containing the dye, and then either had them in dark versus light or skillfully removed one eye of the zebrafish larvae and then see how that affected labeling in the optical tectum which is an area of the brain that is for, um, important for the processing of stimuli. And what you can see in such experiments is that when you have zebrafish, this is the regular zebrafish you see here, with two eyes you see labeling in the optical tectum in both hemispheres. This is the AF9 and the neuropil. These are important parts of your optical tectum that are stimulated. But if you either remove the left or the right eye, when you remove the left eye, you suppress the labeling in the contralateral side. And if you remove the right, light, right eye, you suppress the labeling in the left. So what you can see here is that well, these experiments, first experiments indicate that Capola indeed works in neurons and that for the first time we have a way of chemically integrating neuronal activities over extended periods of time simply by incubating the model organism or exposing it to dye and then certain environmental conditions. We're very excited about this. What I think is also important to keep in mind that what I have talked about is that is now for calcium, but you can easily imagine, well, easily is maybe the wrong word, but you can imagine how you can create integrators for other biochemical activities that then you can follow in vivo or in vitro. With this, um, 
I would like to come to the end. I'd like to mention um, again um, my uh, wonderful co-workers that we have here in Heidelberg, also before in, um, in Lausanne. Um, I think I mentioned all the names already during my presentation. Um, I should also mention people with whom we had collaborated here or helped us a lot in Heidelberg, Mirek Tarnowski, Elisabeth Este, Sebastian Fabret, but also our collaborators in other groups, particularly Jonas Ries, Mike Heilemann, Herwig Bayer for the Fishwork, Luke Leves, Eric Schreiter, and now recently also Jochen Wittbrot. Since I would like to come to the end, I apologize for being longer than what Carl told me to be. Um, but thank you um, for your patience, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Kai. No, no problem at all. Um, it was really a fantastic lecture. We have a number of questions. It's just there's a couple that I think we could maybe just just quickly answer in case people can't join us in the next session. Um, but there's a couple more extended questions that I've taken a note of and we'll take over into the chat, if that, into the next session, if that's okay for you, Kai. Um, so just to start, a couple of simpler questions, or simpler is not the correct term, but maybe more concise questions. Um, is the activity of the protein altered by the labeling? Um, I think a common, common question uh, associated to the first part of the lecture. and to ask at the same time, uh, is it possible to use these dyes with plant tissue or does the cell wall interfere with dye permeability? Well, first of all, the um, first question, which is um, a very important question, is if you create a fusion protein um, of your protein of interest with a tag, how does that affect the, um, the activity of that protein? And um, even though there are examples where expression of a fusion protein because of steric interactions with either of the termini affects the activity um, of that protein, that these examples are relatively rare. And um, I would say for the large majority of proteins, you can either take the protein either at the N or the C terminus. What we have learned is um, much more important is the control of the expression level of the protein. That is overexpression of a protein um, often can lead to mislocalization or activities that the protein does not have when you use the protein at lower concentrations. And often fusion and proteins are expressed with, with promoters that lead to very high levels that then can give problems. However, here the solution is CRISPR-Cas technology that allows you then to achieve um, expression levels that are uh, much, much closer to what the endogenous untagged protein has. And so I think that is the way forward to, um, to address that problem. The second question was plants. Um, I was yeah. just trying to forget that question. Because, yeah. <laughs> it's not the first yeah. time I've heard you being asked that. So, uh. labeling, and labeling and plants is difficult. We need to come up with better dyes. Um, so far, um, there hasn't been much success, I must say, in using these kind of dyes or probes for labeling fusion proteins in plants, including yeast. Also, labeling in yeast is difficult. Often, then it requires then knocking out some efflux pump transporters. But that, of course, um, is um, not a very elegant solution. And often, the resulting yeast strains are um, rather sickly. Um, Okay, then I would ask two, two more questions in this session. Um, the first is, can the mutated halo tags still be detected, for example, in Western blot with commercial antibodies, in case one has to check later on for protein expression levels? And the follow-up question, or not follow-up question, but second question, for how long are the calcium sensors stable? All right. Um, so um, if the halo tag can be detected, um, through antibodies. Um, the mutations that Michelle introduced, these were like two point mutations or two or three point mutations. So I would suspect um, that the antibodies that are commercially available for Halotech will still work on these mutants, um, even though I can't um, tell you with um, certainty. Um, so that then would have to be tested, but I would be surprised if that would not be the case. Um, 
if your protein is fluorescent label, you even don't need an antibody, but you can just scan for fluorescence your, your, your gel if, if, if you do that. Um, the other question is how stable are the calcium indicators? I assume that you're referring to the um, BAPTA based indicators. I also presume so. <laughs> um, and um, these, these um, because they are now covalently attached to a protein, um, are um, very, um, I mean, in contrast to normal cal synthetic calcium indicators that then are also over time, of course, are secreted out again from cells. These molecules are very stable. And the spectroscopic properties in terms of photo bleaching, because as they are based on rhodamines, is also very good. Um, I can't really give you a number now, but um, in our hands, um, or in Nicole's hands, that um, like loss of signal has not been a problem. And if you, re if you would refer to the second part where I have the integrators, where I have then labeling as a function of calcium, um, that um, is also certainly labeled over um, days. Okay, well, thanks very much, Karen. With that, I would say we pause here. So I know I have questions from Andre, Johannes, David, and Peter. I would suggest if you also came into the next session with us, you can either ask them uh, directly, or if you can't join us, I will also read them out and we, we get the answers to you uh, following the session. And so with that, I would say a big thank you again to Professor Jonsson for a really inspiring lecture today. And thank uh, all of you for joining us and please, uh, feel free to, to join us in the next session to continue uh, the Q&A, but where Professor Jonsson can actually see your faces as well. I think a much more uh, yeah, normal interaction would be very enjoyable. With that, Professor Jonsson, thanks so much again and goodbye. Everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, yep. Bye. You're very welcome. See you soon. <laughs>